Uh, kia ora, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. E ngā iwi, e ngā reo, tēnei te mihi atu ki a koutou katoa. Um, good morning and welcome. Welcome if anyone from around the world has joined us today. My name's Dawn Marsh and I'm the Secretary of Atlands New Zealand and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this ICAL Symposium Overtime event. We'll um, begin with a karakia or um, Māori blessing. Let me just share my screen. Are you able to see that? Yep. Great. Uh, whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā taratara ki tai. E hi a ki ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, te hei mauri ora. Thank you. Uh, we have three fantastic presenters today who've recently completed their PhDs and we wanted to take this opportunity to showcase their research uh, with, a, with a wider audience around the world and to help those of us who might be considering doctoral study as learning advisors to decide whether this is the right choice for us and whether this is the right time for us. So our first speaker today will be Mark, followed by Nigel and then Karen. Um, they're each going to give a short presentation on, on their work and their PhD journey. And um, so while they are speaking, we'll just ask you to stay muted and keep your cameras off so that all the bandwidth goes to them. Um, feel free to use the chat to ask questions or reflect or engage with each other while that's going on. And then after that uh, presentation, section of the day. We'll move into a panel discussion and you'll be really welcome to turn your cameras on at that point and ask our, our presenters any questions that you have. So um, yes, given that we, we may have some tech issues, just try and um, keep the bandwidth to a minimum. Um, feel free to ask the questions in the chat, but if we can uh, leave the cameras to the presenters, that would be fantastic. Um, so I'll, I'll stop sharing and hand over to our first speaker, Mark. Well, thanks so much, Dawn. I'm just going to share my presentation. Hmm. Yep, we've got it. Oops. Mixed methods. Yep. There you go. Right. Yeah. The program wide cool. model. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for that lovely introduction, Dawn. Um, I'm just really grateful to have this chance to share some of the uh, findings uh, from my doctoral research, which um, investigated a um, model for embedding discipline specific literacies development in um, whole degree <laughs> programs. And I'm just going to basically talk through a few key findings. Um, so I collected my data during 2018, and that was done at my university. We've got a, about 29,000 students, um, and I used a mixed methods approach to that. Um, mm -hmm. So it was in two phases. Uh, phase one was a questionnaire on literacies development that all of the lecturers at the university had access to, and a focus group and an individual interview with eight learning advisors from um, the team that I work in. Uh, phase two was a cross-departmental collaboration on a Bachelor of Education program, um, and the participants comprised three learning advisors and two liaison librarians from the library and three lecturers from the School of Education. And I conducted six, um, uh, sorry, case studies of six courses, uh, and I used individual interviews, a focus group, and thematic analysis of teaching materials and uh, curriculum documents. Um, and just on the sort of analysis and rigor side, um, for the quantitative data, I got into what was, you know, fa fairly um, uncomfortable and new territory for me with regard to descriptive statistics and calculating those <laughs> and um, conducting something that I've learned is called a paired samples t-test um, <laughs> to investigate, um, you know, whether differences between some of the mean scores were, were significant or not. Um, that was a major, major learning for me. Yeah. Um, for the qualitative data, I actually employed a constructivist grounded theory um, approach to that because yeah. essentially there's 
rather little existing knowledge about program level approaches to embedding. Um, so some of my aims in my research were to um, look at whether we can shift away from uh, focusing only on course level embedding, um, as well as the impacts of graduate profiles and professional standards on the design of literacy teaching materials, and also lecturer capability to teach literacy content after they've collaborated with a learning advisor. Um, so essentially a gap I was trying to address is that um, examples of program level embedding uh, are quite uh, rare or mm. very rare actually. Um, so in, in my research into the you know literature I, I could find essentially two examples that were able to report on um, fully implemented initiatives. Um, and that was quite different from the type of embedding that I was um, researching in my uh, in my thesis. Um, essentially, the what was previously reported was only taught by learning advisors. It was done outside of students' timetable classes, and there was no clear explanation of the pedagogical approaches that they were using. Um, so, in the case of my research, um, it was team taught by learning advisors uh, and lecturers as part of timetabled classes. And there was a clear articulation of the um, pedagogic choices that we were making. Um, so I just sort of, as a, as a bit of context, I think we've got a, a number of barriers to be able to embed in a program uh, manner. And I think based on the literature, um, some of that is around assumptions that are held by uh, institutions and lecturers that essentially um, cast academic literacy development as academic support. Um, and that it's kind of a remedial thing that only for some students. And um, this is kind of um, based on another assumption uh, that um, students will magically osmotically um, etc. Uh, develop literacies during their programs just by being there. Um, and also a, uh, another barrier uh, concerns funding. Um, so for example, at my institution, there's one learning advisor for every 2,696 students, and that's comparable to um, other institutions uh, in this country and um, Australia, Canada, um, and the UK. Um, yeah, and basically there's just never going to be enough uh, learning advisors to work in all programs across uh, an institution. Um, so some kind of whole of institution approach um, is, is necessary. Uh, and that might involve formal connections between learning advisors who are in centralized departments, which is the case where I work. Um, and with then, you know, if there's some sort of um, established connection to lecturers and faculties, or it could be something more like a, a spoken hub model, which um, Neil Murray wrote something about this year, which was quite interesting, where you've got uh, learning advisors in centralized departments and learning advisors in faculties and they're, they're connecting. Um, but yeah, just that's a little bit of context, bit of background. Um, and just, just getting to some of the findings from, from my research. Um, basically, I, I tried to articulate a, a model of program level embedding, as I've indicated previously. Um, and that basically um, uh, revealed that there were six uh, key processes that, that it's helpful to um, um, implement and, and put into place. Uh, so the, this um, overall, I, I gave it this name of the program level collaborative model of embedding literacies development, which is rather a mouthful. Um, so I tried to call it ProCo. When I, I'm not quite sure if that works or not, but um, that's what I called it. Um, but yeah, the, the initial process, one of leading and organizing, uh, I could say a lot more about it, but I'm just gonna say at this point, any of these sorts of um, um, initiatives are contingent on senior leadership staff being involved in the kind of initial approval of it and granting access to staff and programs. It just has to be there. And then for this sort of ongoing, um, planning and review so it doesn't fall by the wayside once you've got it started. Um, but yeah, mapping was is uh, something that we 
did, did very sort of in a very detailed way with the, the lecturers in the Bachelor of Education. Uh, and it involved learning advisors and lecturers analyzing uh, core course assessment tasks and learning advisors then going away and categorizing and logging where literacies are distributed across those courses. Uh, and then with lecturers, um, we refined and agreed on the literacies, literacies focus for each of the courses. Um, the screenshot that um, you can see there is of a Trello board, um, and we use that to uh, communicate all of the, the sort of focus of literacies content in courses with all of the staff, so us and the lecturers. Um, and yeah, looking at this idea of trying to cumulatively um, teach and develop uh, literacies content, um, learning advisors and lecturers um, reported that um, you know students are not usually thinking about their learning in the long term and they've got more of a, a just-in-time approach um, so this kind of supports curriculum design that um, is going to give students multiple opportunities to engage with specific literacy content um, so here, here's a, an example of how um, the learning advisors in my study were, were trying to do this. Um, so there's a teaching slide here from a, a year one course. Um, and essentially the students were shown and, and sort of explained that um, their current assessment, which was an essay, how that connected with one they'd done previously, the uh, annotated bibliography there, and how they would start in year two, um, um, looking at how they would use and connect sources in increasingly complex ways in the uh, sort of more literature review style assessment that was coming. Uh, and then with regard to um, looking at how external um, professional standards connect, um, the graduates from Bachelor of Education programs in this country uh, have to meet the Teaching Council standards in order to be able to apply for registration. Um, so was in one of the um, second year courses, the lecturer and a learning advisor uh, connected a professional learning standard that requires teachers to engage in ongoing inquiry um, in order to solve school uh, classroom problems with um, trying to identify themes while doing a literature review assignment. So it's trying to make really overt connections between the rather academic work they're doing and the, the real world tasks that they will be doing as teachers. Um, yeah, so I think probably one of the like, most interesting parts of this um, process for me was, was being able to articulate this um, um, steps that, that learning advisors and lecturers um, go through when they're trying to design materials collaboratively. Um, essentially, there were four stages that um, the learning advisors were able to, to articulate to me. Um, the first two haven't really previously been very clearly articulated in the literature and they're fundamental to, to the creation of assessment and discipline specific literacy teaching materials. Um, first of all, that the learning advisor listens to the lecturer's expectations of how students should write in their assessments, as well as what students usually find uh, challenging uh, when they're trying to do those. And the, the learning advisor then uh, analyzes samples of previous student work um, in order to identify some specific and teachable instances of what the, lectures, the lecturer is actually looking for. Um, they then have a discussion about that and negotiate what the focus of the materials should be. Um, as the learning advisor is drafting the content, they'll then include the lecturer's feedback um, as they kind of move towards a final set of materials. They both then team teach those um, and then do an evaluation um, and then look at whether they're going to teach it again um, together or perhaps look at um, the lecturer maybe taking on some of that teaching instead. Um, there was also quite a, a clear articulation of, of a pedagogical approach um, and the learning advisors in, in my research employed a, a genre based uh, approach, the teaching and learning cycle. Um, and that involved the teacher uh, modeling some language features, providing students with opportunities for guided practice of those features, 
and then stepping back for students to use the features independently. Um, so a key finding there was that the learning advisors had to balance ideal pedagogy with, with a, a rather limited amount of class time. Um, typically, they had about an hour to an hour and a half um, in a course. Uh, and this meant there was only usually time for modeling and uh, guided practice. Uh, the, the independent part essentially was students working on their assessments outside of class time. Um, so lecturers found that modeling, uh, sorry, learning advisors and lecturers reported that modeling was beneficial. Um, that's because students can know how they are expected to write in their assessments and how they can engage with the, um, the reading materials for, for different purposes. Um, and yeah, guided practice was seen as beneficial because obviously the learning advisors in the room, they can check how students are using particular content and students can immediately use content then in their assessments because it's um, focused on that time frame. Um, yeah, just a, a few points on, on team teaching. Um, it was really interesting to hear from lecturers, not just learning advisors, because that's who I normally talk to, of course, um, what they saw as the benefit of yeah, collaboratively teaching literacy content um, in their courses. Um, but yeah, from a learning advisor perspective, um, they thought that having the lecturer actively involved in the literacy teaching was a real endorsement um, to students of how important it was. Um, lecturers thought that there was this sort of, um, yeah, special presence of a second specialist staff member, the, the learning advisor, sort of showing students that, um, oh, sorry, that there was a, um, uh, uh, a yeah, like a, a, a two-pronged focus, dual focus that they needed to engage in. Um, so it was really like a, yeah, a manifestation, these two people, these two things to look at. Uh, and also there was this, this great involvement of the lecturer in um, yeah, contributing to the design and the revision of the teaching material. So it was, you know, like a real, a real a loop of collaboration. Um, so the sixth process, this, this one called handover, it, at the stage that I did the research in 2018, we hadn't really um, implemented that fully, but I, what I did do was just ask all of the participants what their, their thoughts were about it. And essentially we're talking about whether learning advisors can pass on the teaching of literacy content to lecturers. Um, and yeah, the learning advisors were all kind of saying things along the lines of, you know, they're a small team, they can't work across all of the university. Um, and they thought that perhaps one way of doing this was to work on um, a sort of project basis on a program, embed the literacy teaching into the program, um, give the lecturers chances to learn how to do it. And then essentially learning advisors would move on and, and work elsewhere. Um, so the lecturers who responded to my questionnaire kind of could see that they were, um, yeah, confident and capable of, of teaching literacy content after collaboration. Um, and the um, lecturers in my case studies agreed with that, but, but being able to sort of talk to them in a bit more detail, they, they had a number of concerns um, that they expressed. And they thought it actually wouldn't be optimal to hand over the teaching of literacy's content because um, yeah, they, they saw learning advisors as having greater expertise in, in this area. Uh, this idea that students seemed more engaged by the, the visiting specialist than just the lecturer themselves trying to teach that content. And that um, they were concerned that, yeah, perhaps the literacy content might get marginalized uh, in some cases by some lecturers. Uh, but yeah, in, in summary, I, I feel like, um, uh, you know, my, my research indicates that program level embeddings got implications uh, for how we design curricula. Uh, because yeah, we've, we're positioning literacy's development as, as something that's core um, and it's to be taught within and through specific disciplines. Um, and that's instead of that rather, I think what we probably frequently experience this rather fragmented individual effort um, from disparate and isolated teams. Um, and that, you know, for a whole of institution approach to work, it's got to be led from the, from the top. Uh, and that uh, the role of the lecturer also needs some reconsideration because lecturers would need to be involved in the provision of literacies teaching as part of um, their disciplines. But yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. I've probably taken slightly too long, but um, yeah, thanks for your intention so far. Um, there's some contact details there and I'm, I'm looking forward to discussing a bit more about 
how I went about the research when we get to the panel. But um, yeah, in the meantime, uh, it's, um, I believe it's Nigel who's going to talk next. Thanks, uh, Nigel. When you're ready, take it away. All good. Can you see? Right. Yes, fantastic. Okay, so I feel a little bit like <laughs> hard egg to follow for Mark. Uh, I'm not strictly a, a learning advisor. Um, I got a job at um, Auckland University when I graduated and I was a learning teacher and development advisor. So what I basically did was help uh, redo a lot of the generic workshops. Uh, I remote two of them by myself. And then I worked with the librarian staff to um, brainstorm and get them up to standard. Uh, we did a lot of work on their doctoral skills. And then um, they started uh, letting a lot of the library staff go. So um, I was advised to move over to learning design, which uh, I did, and it was an opportunity I don't regret. So as you can see from the title, it's quite different to Marx. Um, while the title of this research may seem a little bit limited in scope, at the time it was one of the earliest in-depth dissertations to a deep dive into why I speak of one of the major lingua francas, uh, English, Spanish, Arabic, uh, Mandarin, in this case English, would be in the situation of wanting to, or possibly needing to, learn the minority language of the host nation they were residing in. Until this time, the literature on second language acquisition had been almost entirely centered around learners of English. This makes sense. Using Japan in as an example, every school and first year two, three student must learn English. And yet for the huge accompanying investment, those who have passed through this process and are fluent English speakers total less than 5%. So what's the problem or problems? My research would reveal striking similarities in its findings to those of the largely amotivated and or demotivated Japanese students among others. Ah, can't see to be able to move forward, why is that? Just maybe stop sharing and start sharing again. Sometimes it freezes. No. Okay, so first the, sh up. the share is not working yet, Nigel. Oh, it doesn't mean here. Click again. Nope. Would you like me to? Have a go with that other version. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's okay. Things happen. Oh yeah. Is that sharing okay? Yep. Okay. Okay. So first up, we've got some uh, generic um, jargon. It might sound pretty simple, but we need to know what our terms of reference are to keep us on the same page. And L1 refers to the first language that you speak, typically because it was a language of the nation you were born and raised in. And L2 is a second language, a language you have acquired in addition to your first language. So a Japanese national living in England, L1 would be Japanese and the L2 would be English. Because the vast majority of L2 research is largely centered on L2 learners of English, we need to draw some important differentiations here. As the slide states, an ESL learner might be a Japanese uh, I want to speak or learn English in a country where English is the L1, but an EFL learner, on the other hand, resides in a nation where the L1 is not English and is learning it as an L2, typically in the form of formal classroom uh, study. And due to the distinct uh, uh, possibility by comparison with ESL learners, opportunities beyond the classroom to learn and experiment with English are severely marginalized. I won't let me move ahead again. What's that? Oh, I'm moving it. <laughs> you oh, you can tell me when to okay, move. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll do it. okay, good, good, good. Okay, now we need to drill down to the key definitions that define this research. While this may sound a bit pedantic, an understanding of the cause and effect relationship of the first two definitions can significantly and positively enhance how you can potentially interact with a student of yours who may be struggling academically, but you not knowing why. I'll just give you a chance to read the first three uh, definitions. Please signal when you're ready to continue. I'm good. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Dawn. 
Yep. Next. Yeah. Okay. At the beginning of 2005, I found myself teaching, uh, among other CEOs and Korean air cabin crew in Kang Nam in the heart of Seoul. I did this for two years, followed by the complete opposite, a one-year stint among the rice paddies deep in the countryside, teaching at a university. These were incredible experiences. Then I gained a gig at the University of Ulsan. Ulsan, we see pictured here, which is the center of the Hyundai uh, heavy industries, uh, cars, shipyards, uh, televisions, phones, etc. I was excited. Why? The three previous years the universe had been shining its positive light hard on me. I'd met some of the most cool, intelligent, adventurous seeking spirits who completed my MO Tessel and traveled right throughout Asia alone with my backpack. I was more alive than I had been in years and I wanted this to continue. But here was the conundrum of academia. The downside of gaining a job in a high ranked university, from my perspective, was that there seemed to be little camaraderie, humor, wanting to get to know you, or a sense of sharing. For the first time since leaving New Zealand, I'd had a slump. My arrival at the beginning of this PhD was largely a glorious accident. I was invited to a Buddhist conference on Jeju Island in July 2008. There on the top floor of the Hilton Hotel, former Hilton Hotel, used by this organization, there was photo upon photo of the lay leader, Daisaku Ikeda, receiving multi honorary doctorates. Was the university giving me a hint? Don't be ridiculous, I thought. But there was a void waiting for me in Ulsan. I had the space, why not? And so for the next year, I preached universities all over the world. The problem was they all required a live-in presence when I was under contract in year in Korea. Australian universities tended not to. Macquarie University, which has a strong linguistics department, accepted my application and two days before the coursework component started, they told me I was on a scholarship at that time with 50 grand. So next slide, please. So I was in a good mood. <laughs> yeah. I'll just let you read the slide. This is the study and the participants. Very, very uh, abridged, just to make it simple. Please signal when you're ready again. Yeah, good. Okay. While there are many highly relevant... Uh, oh, next slide. Yeah, thanks. While there are many highly relevant theoretical contracts, uh, constructs to inform our talk, I've cherry-picked those ones which I believe will inform us the most. Uh, Zoltan Dornier mentioned here is arguably the most respected researcher in the world on L2 acquisition motivation, and his motivational learning system has redefined the research landscape by focusing on the individual, how they see themselves, and how they interpret their environment. This is a big move away from the former focus on the class and the teacher. His field research and that of Emma Ushioda substantially informed my literature review was made complete by providing equal provision for the pathfinding, sorry, pathfinding work of Bonnie Norton on the lack of accommodation accorded her participants. These were immigrant women into Canada, mostly working class as L2 speakers of English and their communities of practice. This was like work and daily life. And Casanova's case studies of English L1 users working in Japan and how such factors as pollution, noise, cultural alienation, alienation, relationship difficulties, among others, impacted them. So Norton was like uh, moving away from strictly uh, the factors that might affect them as a simply as an English learner because the language is hard uh, to learn as they couldn't get any traction uh, to use it. And Casanave moved the uh, moved the literature forward again because she brought in uh, she directly uh, made a correlation with psychological factors, uh, maybe external ones. So one of her big focuses was on relationship difficulties and uh, pollution. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, hang on, there we go. There we go, <laughs> pray. <laughs> okay, I'll give you a chance to read the slide here. These are the major findings of the research. Good. Okay. Now, the most striking findings of this research was that the only participant to achieve fluency in Korean was the only one who never attended any Korean classes, either formally, uh, informally, or with a tutor. Her motivation was based on her desire to become an active member of a Christian church that only had Korean-speaking members. 
Oh, that's quite important to notice, actually. There was a strongly recorded level of dissatisfaction among all the others with respect to the L2 classroom learning experiences. Too formal, not student-centered, not real world. However, the biggest demotivating factor as shared by Norton's participants was a perceived lack of accommodation accorded them as L2 speakers of Korean. So what you'd use here is like a person's going down to like, uh, say, a gym, and they've finished their workout, and they want to know where the sauna is. And you have to say sauna in Korean. And it's pretty obvious, you know, you're either going to be going there or the shower. And the, there would be a refusal to understand why the person wouldn't just say down the hall. Now, this is what our lack of accommodation is. And people get very, very despondent with this. Um, added to such factors that the majority of these participants were employed on one, or in some cases, two year cases. Uh, the uh, Christian lady was on a tenure. Um, uh, an active dissuading of management by uh, uh, to use English in the L2 classrooms. These are also key A motivators. Okay, so and it's also entirely possible to operate with only survival English in Korean in daily life. Just go to the bank, name sign, you're fine. So returning on investment in a minority language with perceived limited transferable value was deemed low. Okay, next slide, please, Dawn. Good. Now this is a bit interesting. This is starting to like maybe. Uh, get some traction with you as our learning advisors. One of the most intriguing findings of this research was that it was shared, um, <clears throat> when I shared this with the uh, linguistics department at Macquarie, they noted that my, the experience of my participants, almost to the letter, directly correlated with what we he have here on the screen. These are the two major uh, biggest findings, uh, sorry, two biggest studies of L2 classroom de demotivation in the world. Dornier's uh, 1998 uh, study was of 4,000 Hungarian students of English, French, German, and Spanish, and Sakai Gikuchi, two Japanese researchers. And in 2009, they did a summation of all leading such studies of demotivation to learn English among Japanese students. As you see in red, by far the most demotivating factor, and this had nothing to do with how academically qualified the teacher was, uh, was the, their attitude, okay, the attitude. So very important to note there. And black are the to be expected factors, but it's important not down to, to downplay the importance of pre-existing demotivated factors, which you've got there in green. A learner may bring them with them into a learning context. Okay, so uh, at Auckland University, there's, uh, I'm actively involved in a pre-entry maths course. This is for people that are scared about moving beyond putting two and two equals four, which includes me. Um, and one of the things I'm trying to get across in our planning is that these people will come in with a high level of um, a motivation. And what we want to do is make is to make sure that they don't become demotivated for as long as possible. We don't want them to hit a, a snag on the first uh, session and say, that's it, I'm not coming back. Uh, also, if there's going to be a move to bring in Tamara Maori uh, in New Zealand uh, in the school system, these are uh, one green factors that we might want to consider. Okay, next slide, please. So now, ta da! <laughs> How can any uh, aspect of this research inform your work as a learning advisor? Again, I'll give you a chance to read the slides and signal when you're ready. Yep. Okay, so while uh, I don't know. Yeah, the findings of my participants may be largely irrelevant here, but the literature that theoretically underpins it isn't. If you find yourself face to face with a student who you may not know how to access, and maybe even on a subconscious level due to one or more of the factors limited here. So if we use like accommodation in the broader sense, it might be that the student feels uh, they haven't got a voice inside a tutorial or a class. Um, it's too highbrow. Um, yeah, like that. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is important. Well, not directly related to this research at all. I've talked about this at length with my supervisor when I was on the verge of quitting, and I found uh, multiple fellow candidates of my uh, intake. There was 12 of us. We we're all studying by distance uh, overseas. Uh, after we finished the uh, coursework, three uh, pulled out. Um, and this is quite sad because it was actually quite a rigorous process to, to get in. And um, I spoke to them on email because I was quite sad. Uh, a couple of them were in the Middle East and I was actually going to go and see them on 
holiday and I felt I wouldn't have that because I felt like I didn't feel right. And they also they felt a, a very strong sense of uh, imposter syndrome. I, I personally think it's a silent killer. It can rob you of your soul. And I think in some ways academia plays on this. So when you have a student, particularly a high research uh, student or a master's student, just bear that in mind and be kind. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, how does this research directly inform my work? Okay, so the biggest tangible benefit uh, I can see in my working life is I've been able to get traction very quickly and with repeated success, particularly with our engineering faculty, both as a learning designer and in my previous role as a learning and teaching development advisor. There I work with both students and academics, which deeply inform my current practice. In large part, I believe this traction is due to uh, emotional intelligence being complemented by academic credentials. Hopefully, a bit of the eye on my part. Imagine you're a very well-respected expert in your chosen field, but your students are either bombing and or not there, and if they are, they report a strong sense of dissatisfaction or don't understand, and the course has more than a thousand enrolled in it. As Elton John said post-recovery, to ask for help is the most spiritual thing a person can do. To collaborate and work through why uh, a major course, engineering course, maybe red flag, takes, takes tremendous courage on behalf of the academic and professional staff. And they know that I get that. The academic, uh, academic sorry, the engineering academics in particular that I've worked with, and it's been a lot now, have all been highly receptive to hearing and seeing how my learning and teaching experience can inform that of their students. What we did here was particularly to create a literature review workshop targeting uh, international and mature domestic students. This has now been placed online uh, for six departments within the faculty. Uh, I led a project in which we were able to reverse an 80% failure rate in an engineering master's course. This was largely by internationals again. Online support and self-study access and assessment resources were complemented by a program of live and Zoom workshops where I trained facilitators uh, and gave in how to give individual and small group support prior to submission of their written assignments. So the University of Auckland, we don't really have learning advisors anymore. Uh, it's more this kind of approach. It's sort of faculty based and they have it where they call um, teaching assistants. Um, I also have a very strong relationship with our UX team of designers, even the sort of graphic uh, people, which is in part derived from me being able to support them pedagogically as they do me technologically. We're very, um, uh, symbiotic there. Uh, we both know a lot about something and we, we know nothing about the other, so we're always asking each other to help out. It's, it's quite a beautiful relationship. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Thank you. So Fantastic. You want, thank you. You want me to stop share? No, that's me sharing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, Karen, we'll hand over to you. You need to unmute, lovely. Thanks, Dawn, and thanks so much, Mark and Nigel. So, um, yeah, trying to step up to your space. So I'm going to share my screen here. Yes, that's working. Mm -hmm. I'll just open it up here. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so um, thanks for joining us today. It's my very great privilege to um, share some thoughts about the PhD journey and some of what I did and some of my findings and implications for us as educators. Um, I thought I'd start off with just giving you a wee timeline of how this thing happened. So it took eight years from beginning to end, five years actually doing it. Um, so I conducted a pilot study initially, and then um, the research person I was working with at Pitera, she she said to me one day, she said, um, look, why don't you do a PhD? So I so I said, all right, then okay, why not? <laughs> so then the hunt was on for a supervisor in an institution, and um, I was very fortunate to come across a Professor Mervyn Hyde at the University of Sunshine Coast in Australia. Um, he, um, he's an international expert in diversity and education. He brought associate professor Michael Nagel on, who's an international expert in learning and child development. And um, I was very fortunate to get um, a, a grant from the federal government to pay for my PhD. So um, it, was, it all just fell into place really well. Um, 
I had to go to Australia for orientation. That was the only time that I actually had to attend the university. Although I must say that I did sneak back in between lockdowns to graduate, which was fantastic. Um, oh, so you can see that my first ethics approval um, came through in 2017, and that was my qualitative studies, and I'll go over the design in a minute. Um, so in 2019, so we we're already, you know, like a couple of years down the track, um, my research proposal was sent out for external review, and unbeknownst to me, it was sent to the top dude in the world, and I was absolutely horrified that my supervisor did that. But it turns out, of course, that it was a, it was a fabulous thing because he came back with some really good feedback. Um, we had to do confirmation seminars at my university. So coming this far, you then had to um, present your research proposal and they decided whether you could continue with your PhD or not. Um, and fortunately, they said I could. So that was the beginning of my candidature there. And um, at this, this whole time that I was developing the um, research proposal, I was working on um, two quantitative studies. Um, in 2020, I went and put in another um, ethics application for the qualitative study. And I'll just add here too that these, um, because of where the university was situated, um, these, uh, my, my ethics applications actually went through to the um, Australian federal government. So you can imagine <laughs> all the stuff that's involved with putting together these ethics applications. They're huge. I mean, they're, they're PhD theses in themselves, really. Um, so in 2021, my thesis was sent out for independent review. Um, I did, I submitted and I did my final seminar pre presentation and the thesis went to the examiners. Um, I got feedback and I resubmitted and I was awarded the PhD. Yay, that was awesome. So that's the, that's the journey. It's definitely not for the faint hearted, but I would say that if you're passionate about something, um, it's definitely worth considering. So this was the, um, my, my design. So you can see it's in two stages, um, three separate studies, two quantitative and one qualitative. This, quanti this quantitative study here, coming up with a, um, with a survey that looks at um, perceptions of success. Um, I'm not even touching on this today, but um, it's in the process of being published. So um, you can read about it or you can ask me about it at any time too. So I just wanted to look sort of briefly at these two studies here, the last quantitative and the qualitative study. But first, a little bit of background. So um, people vary in the way in which they react to environmental stimuli. Some people are much more noticing of and reactive to internal, external, social and emotional stimuli, stimulation. And there are three main underpinnings to this is environmental. So by this, I mean, um, it behooves um, a particular um, group of animals to have to have a minority group that's more vigilant of the environment, so they would might notice predators or or food before others. Um, there's a genetic underpinning, and in the past, um, the genetic underpinning has been viewed more as a vulnerability. However, recent research shows that these um, previously known vulnerability genes also have some distinct advantages. So we're now using words like plasticity rather than vulnerability. But the phenotypic um, expression of high sensitivity is the personality trait of sensory processing sensitivity. And this is what I'm referring to today. And this is what I looked at in my work. So some of the hallmarks of sensory processing sensitivity, a highly tuned nervous system, Deep cognitive processing of information. Now, this has implications for teaching and learning because if you can imagine, if you're spending a lot of effort um, processing lots and lots of incoming stim stimuli, um, it may take you longer to understand information. So it's really important for um, teaching staff to understand this. Increased emotional reactivity and empathy. So we know that emotional connection is very good for learning. Um, and it can also have um, a take a personal cost as well. Um, the propensity to absorb, observe before taking action, noticing of subtleties, being uncomfortable being observed or assessed, 
and maybe particularly moved by art from nature and a propensity to become overwhelmed when there's a lot of things happening at once. So different cultures view sensitivity differently and our Western culture has typically viewed it um, quite negatively. For example, if anyone's ever said that to you, I'm sure they didn't mean it as a compliment, right? More and more research is showing that there are some huge advantages associated with high sensitivity. And I just need to point out here that I'm not talking about diagnosed conditions like ASD or ADHD or the, or the likes. Although in saying that, um, many of these diagnosed conditions also do have elements of high sensitivity. What I'm talking about here is just a minority group of the population who are just more reactive to their environments. And, and I would point out too, that historically, people who are highly sensitive have in the past been diagnosed with conditions such as those you see there. So just looking at the measures and types and levels of sensitivity, it's measured by the Highly Sensitive Person Scale, which was de developed by American psychologist Elaine Aaron in 1997, although I used a subsequent version of this, which I'll explain. Um, uh, there are also three subscales, aesthetic sensitivity, which is noticing the subtleties, ease of excitation, um, which is um, reacting to having a lot of things going on at once, and low sensory threshold, which is reaction to things around like light, noise, smell. Sensitivity exists on a continuum with approximately 30% of the population said to be low, 40% medium, and 30% high. So we use the dandelion tulip orchid met metaphor to explain this. Dandelions pretty much can thrive anywhere. Tulips require a little bit more care and orchids require optimal conditions in which to flourish. But when they have them, the results are spectacular. So I use the, highly the 12 item highly sensitive person scale. Remember when I, when I mentioned that my supervisor sent my research proposal to the world leader. This is the world leader, Michael Kluis, University of London. So he has adapted um, the original scale to this 12 item scale and this is the one I used. So it's 12 items on a seven point Likert scale, scale and it has questions such as these. So it gives you a reading for overall sensitivity and also the three subscales. So the background to my research was um, as learning advisors, we have the privilege of working very closely with students. But I became curious about some behavior with students and typically these were the high performing students who didn't feel that they could possibly hand an assignment in before I or another learning advisor had had a look. And um, I wondered why that was. I went to literature and I couldn't find anything. Um, and I found my, myself um, looking at Elaine Aaron's work and the work of other researchers in the sensitivity field. So I conducted this pilot study, just highly sensitive learners find it useful to know about high sensitivity. Well, the noise was deafening. Yep, not only did they find it useful, but um, all the participants in my pilot study said that it was life-changing to know about this. So I thought that I had a little bit of a mandate to go ahead and do some further research on this, which is what I did. Now, I'm just gonna kind of gloss over this a little bit. So the first one was the, the survey design. You see that there were three phases of originally, this is the last phase. I'm not gonna to go too much into it. Um, like Mark, I found myself learning lots and lots and lots about statistics and programs I knew nothing about. And it, as a, um, as a distance student too, I didn't, I didn't really have any support. So um, I spent lots of time on YouTube. But you can see here, look, if you wanna know anything about all of this stuff, I'm happy to share. The key here is that, um, is that the survey was found to be reliable and five factors were identified, intellectual stimulation, work-life balance, generic skills, learning community and commitment to learning. And here it is. So 27 item um, survey questions, um, it's a universal statement. I feel successful in my study when followed by statements, seven point Likert scale and general ratings for overall success and individual factors as well. 
So you've got those five factors there I already shared with you. So some conclusions from the first study. Promising measure of success promoting attitudes and strategies. Um, students can use it to assess um, personal capacity. Um, tutors can use it to assess cohort levels of capacity and to identify gaps. And it's useful to identify um, levels when assessing academic or disability support and ratings from interventions. And ratings can inform interventions and personal study plans. This one here shouldn't be in there. I don't know why that's there. That just pretend it's not there. It shouldn't be there. Don't know why. So the second study was another quantitative study. So what I wanted to do was look at levels of sensitivity and look at levels of um, personal success promoting attitudes and strategies. So um, again, so 365 participants in this one. Um, SPSS I used, again, um, we don't need to worry about all that. So I measured sensitivity levels at the 30th and 70th percentiles. And more geeky statistics stuff you can see there. Um, and yeah, so what this is saying here is that high sensitivity was associated with intellectual stimulation, work-life balance, and generic skills. And success promoting attitudes and behaviors were highly associated with aesthetic sensitivity and ease of excitation. That's the, that's the subscale of having lots of things going on at once. So, some findings. High sensitivity is associated with high levels of success promoting attitudes and strategies. So we've already talked about that. Intellectual stimulation and generic skills. Work-life balance. And actually what I'd like to point out here was that, that there's no, there's no um, research that looks at work-life balance for students in general. Um, some of it looks at particular cohort, cohorts, like for instance, PhD students. Um, and the attrition rate is appalling, um, as Nigel alluded to. Um, and the actually the cost to, to um, institutions and personal costs is huge for all of this research that is not done, but I digress. And success promoting attitudes associated with EOA and AES, as I mentioned. Some of the conclusions, um, high sensitivity is associated with the utilization of interventions and low levels of sensitivity um, may lead to resistance. Um, so, I think it's a good idea to establish sensitivity levels for students seeking academic or disability support to precisely plan learning interventions or study plans and institutions to provide education on sensitivity and programs to space assessments evenly, evenly to stop overwhelming students. And findings could be helpful for students with sensory variances, um, no matter where the sensory variance comes from. So this could include students um, with diagnosed conditions, of course. Um, so on to the qualitative study. So there was a link in the previous study and sensitivity was set at the 70th percentile and there were um, 13 participants. So I conducted Zoom interviews, use inductive semantic thematic analysis and came up with 30, six um, codes that were collapsed into 16. And these were identified. Um, benefits of high sensitivity, challenges in learning community and institutional support. I know I'm just, I'm just shooting through here, so I hope you can make sense of all of this. So um, the literature tells us that high levels of sensitivity are associated with deep cognitive functioning, enhanced memory and attention, heightened awareness, giftedness, heightened connections with tasks that have been meaningful, fine visual distinctions, conscientiousness, divergent thinking, high entrepreneurial intention, enhanced ability of, to utilize interventions, as I've mentioned. So some of the advantages identified in my study, high levels of motivation and a desire to make a difference, 
valuing of independent learning, utilization of an array of complex metacognitive strategies, prioritization of work-life balance, high levels of self-efficacy, and prioritization of self-care, including alone time, exercise, and nature, all of which we know are really, really beneficial for well-being. Some of the challenges identified by highly sensitive learners, tendency to overthink and overwork, feeling overwhelmed when there are multiple demands, need time to process information, as I've already mentioned, may not feel comfortable contributing to class discussions. And again, I just want to highlight this because this is really, really important for um, educators to know. I'm often stressed by group works and presentation that came out loud and clear, and they often have low sensory thresholds. So just a quick look at the implications of low sensory thresholds because we all work in, um, in learning environments can be challenging. So light, we don't have upper levels, um, the upper levels are not regulated and we work in over illuminated conditions and you can see there that, that there are a number of health um, stresses there but also to bear in mind that light is particularly bothersome for students who suffer from, who have dyslexia, Erlen syndrome, ASD or ADHD. So um, the, the, the problems that we face with overhead fluorescent light um, are huge for many of our students and indeed for us as well. Noise is, it can be even more problematic because of the nature of the way that it just pops in and grabs your attention. So what, if you're trying to learn something, you're trying to forge neural pathways, noise comes in and um, diverts your attention away from the neural pathways. And it has um, profound implications on, on um, aspects of learning as listed there. Now, indoor environmental pollution, uh, pollutants, fragrances are not, um, not regulated at all. And they contain many volatile organic compounds, including irritants, poisons, and carcinogens. Can lead to a number of, of really severe um, physical problems. And also to they impact cognitive ability, concentration, comprehension, and problem solving amongst other things. Now, what I'm talking about here is I'm, I'm talking about things like um, cleaning products, personal products, perfumes, colognes, and such like, um, and some other environmental um, things that can, can affect people. Um, pressure, visual chaos, having a lot going on, temperatures, furnishings, and um, other people. And this includes being observed exams and social interactions. So some institutional recommendations. Provide education on environmental sensitivity. This is absolutely the key. Like you can't address it if you don't understand it. Consider establishing personal levels of sensitivity when accessing academic or disability support. As mentioned earlier, um, sensitivity impacts the way that um, people learn. It impacts the way that people, um, people um, process information and also to the way that they are able to utilize interventions provide low sensory spaces, have a space on the campus where people can just go and chill out, get away from the bright lights, get away from all the noise, get away from other people. Consider fragrant free policies. I love this one. It's highly contentious, but for instance, in Canada, um, you can't enter government buildings, uh, schools, hospitals, tertiary institutions, um, if you're wearing perfume or cologne. And, um, and I, so I'm just going to throw it out here to all, all educators. Um, lead, lead by example. Um, don't wear perfumes and things if you're dealing with students. Save it for when you go out night clubbing and things. Keep social work and study spaces separate. It's a no-brainer. But for instance, in our institution, we have a ping pong table in the library. Um, it just beggars belief, really. Not a good idea. 
provide flexible working and study arrangements so that students aren't required to attend um, attend lectures in person all the time. And I, I think maybe we've, we've turned a corner thanks to COVID here. Limit group work and presentations. Certainly if the learning outcomes are collaboration or presentation skills, use them. But if they're not, um, you know, don't, don't use group work and presentations necessarily as an assessment tool, offer a written, a written um, option. Create a sensitive friendly environment and have sensitivity ambassadors. We're all very familiar with rainbow friendly environments. I'd like to see our institutions become sensitive friendly. So just to finish off, the Okanaga Charter, uh, uh, Charter calls for higher education institutions to provide learning environments that foster student well-being. So I think that by understanding sensitivity and its impact for learning, we can provide learning environments that are inclusive of all our learning, all our learners, and most particularly the highly sensitive ones. Thank you. Um, I just direct your attention to this website here, sensitivityresearch.com. Um, this was established by Michael Plurs, University of London, and um, the top sensitivity researchers. It exists primarily for sensitivity researchers, but it's got lots and lots of really interesting information on it. And it's also got sensitivity tests. So if you're interested in finding out anything else about this, visit sensitivityresearch.com and I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, I've seen you speak a couple of times now and I always get something new out of your talks each time um, that I want to run away and, and look up and, and think about. So thank you so much for that. And thank you all for sharing your research. I think it's amazing to see the um, the range of topics and the range of areas that, that learning advisors move into and work in and, and research. So that was, that was fantastic to see such a, a broad array. I I wonder if we could start our, our panel discussion by asking each of you to share something that you're really proud of that you, you know, a, a real highlight for you and an achievement for you from your PhD, but also maybe a, a disappointment or a, a regret or a, I don't know, a, a challenge that you had along the way. Can we maybe go backwards, Karen? Can we start with you? Oh, thanks, Dawn. Well, the thing that I'm most proud about is that I've done it, but the reason I did it was because I wanted to make a difference. And so that's that's the thing that I'm loving now, is that I can get out there and um, gather together all these sensitivity warriors and, and just get the word out there. Because I frankly was gobsmacked that we don't know anything about this in the education context. It's crazy. It's out there in psychology, um, but not education. So. I'm proud that I can now get out there and, and start shaking things up. Um, probably the biggest challenge I had was that um, I chose I chose a rock star um, supervisor, and he chose another rock star supervisor. And I guess I found out that rock star supervisors are pretty busy people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so pretty much, I had to figure figure it all out myself. That's, that would be, uh, if, if I was to advise anybody about, uh, about doing a PhD, choose your supervisor very, very carefully. Um, also, neither of mine were in the field either. So I really, I really was on my own. So choose someone in your field. Choose someone who, who has the time to spend with you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that advice. I think that's that's really important. Um, Nigel, how about you? Something that you you um, are proud or passionate about, and something that you um, did didn't enjoy, regret, or would like to have gone differently. Hmm. I guess for me, I had two uh, highlights. Um, about halfway through, I got very very um, low uh, mentally with the whole I had a lot going on in my personal life and I found the isolation of this was just oh my god it was just awful and um, as part of my scholarship I had to represent Macquarie University at an international conference and um, there was a cancellation to go to Cambridge in England 
uh, at the very last minute. So I had to book and go basically when in a 36 hour window. And um, I was only given a poster presentation, but a couple of uh, people came up there and were very, very um, receptive. They were both Japanese people. So for the first time I had like, um, somebody was interested. And um, that was a real buzz. And then I um, went to see uh, Zoltan Dornier at Nottingham. And this is like, as Karen was saying about the rock star thing, this is like someone doing karaoke at the local pub, getting four hours with Bruce Springsteen. I mean, he gave me like carte blanche. And I just had, I had all these questions. And for the first time, I was able to just get an answer. I mean, it, it, was, it was like a bit of a hit. And then... Um, when my first article was published, Bonnie Norton, as I mentioned there, she emailed me and said, um, thank you for um, doing this because uh, I'm the only one out there. So they'd be the positives. And the, the negative for me was the um, the grind and the fact that um, during my sort of PhD journey um, to survive, I had to like put a lot of energy into like developing a, a high emotional intelligence. I had a lot of problems with my family when my mother died. And um, it, it moved me further and further away from academia. I sort of felt that this whole sort of, everything's about sort of, well, in my case, I always felt it's like, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. It's, can't you ever just be positive? You know, that was, so, so that's mine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it can be a bit of a, a knocking machine, yeah, can't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if you've got other stuff going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. people forget the word constructive and constructive mm. criticism mm. sometimes. <laughs> <Yeah>. mm. <laughs> And how about you, Mark? What, what about what were the highlights of those for you? Um, yeah, I would say from the perspective of a like a learning advisor who's especially interested in the sort of literacy development side of things, um, I would say that being able to uh, put something together that can package some sort of model for making literacy development part of the mainstream, um, I think that was probably the thing I'm most sort of um, I would say, I don't know if I'm proud, but I'm sort of really pleased to have been able to do that. And um, I think it's, yeah, we're often a bit peripheral in terms of um, the contribution to the student learning journey. And I think it's a massive disservice to what could be a, a much better provision. Um, so yeah, that, that was something I was really pleased with. I would say that the, the negative sides are, I've, I've sort of had perspective now, and I've, I've sort of forgotten about a lot of it, I suppose, but uh, I guess the, the biggest one for me was having to re, re, redesign my, my study. So I had a completely different research design to begin with that involved working with students, um, looking at um, how online forums and other spaces were being used. Um, it was, yeah, I thought it had great potential um, and I had two different goes of it over, several um, uh, semesters and uh, just could not get the student participation and um, I think part, part of the issue was was the ethical uh, hoops that were required and uh, yeah so I, I had to sort of stop after about five years so I mean I was part-time but five years in I had to sort of put that down go with the design that I've talked about today um, and that all went much much more swimmingly and I think uh, part of that is that the participants were staff, not students, and staff who have done research or are involved in research are much more sympathetic to how hard it is to get participation in research. So um, that, that was a, a wonderful change. Mm. Uh, I, that, that came up, I think, in, in the talks a little bit, that, that process of getting through that ethical review or getting the, you know, the approval for the methodology or, or to, you know, to, to conduct the research was was that a hurdle for for you too nigel karen yeah for me personally i found it a little bit uh sort of um unnecessarily bureaucratic like with me like we, i'd already worked out we're going to get seven as i put on the slides we get seven participants from one university and then one from seven others and then it's like the kind of things that they put in my way were sort of like I thought they were kind of like laughable really. It's like we can have a conflict of interest because you know these people and it's like, oh, I'm only asking them questions about their professional life and surely if I know them, it's going to make them be more open to me. It's like, mm. I, I found a lot of it was a bit daft, to be honest. Yeah. 
I, I've had um, Māori students who've really struggled with that because when you're using your kaupapa Māori methodology, you know, having a relationship with someone and, and having that shared connection is actually a really important part of um, the feeling of safety for participants. Mm. And so I think maybe we're, we're starting to get better about not seeing that as bias or not seeing that as conflict of interest. But I certainly think that kind of, you know, Western mindset of you must be completely objective and neutral and not have anything to do with anyone is, is something that's a challenge, isn't it, in a lot yeah. of research designs. And a lot of like, like in my sort of situation, because I knew, I knew 11 of them actually quite well, and um, I kind of knew like their challenges, you know. I mean, like, mm -hmm. you know, two kids and blah, 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 one got sick, and I, I knew what was going on. So I could sort yeah. of like we had the questions were pretty like I felt like the same format, but they're pretty open ended questions. But um, I could sort of nudge it, like you know. Yeah. Why do you mention something about the problem with the kids? You know, well, I don't know. Like you know, yeah. you said like they expected you to like know Korean, like that. Did they help you? No, they didn't. Like talk yeah. to me about that. So you know, so I sort of thought, you know, if you just you're sitting there doing, you suddenly get an email, you know, I'm going to come down on the train and interview for you for three hours. Yeah. And you don't know who I am. Yeah. You might not be very receptive to being open to me. I I, I probably wouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think too, if you're yeah. if you're researching a fairly narrow field as well, I have a, a friend doing a PhD in open education, and he's been working in that field for a long time, um, and is quite leading in that area. And so, of course, he knows the people that yeah, he's yeah, going yeah, to be yeah. interviewing. How could he not? You know. <laughs> so mm, yeah. Mm, How about you, Karen? Did you find that sort of ethical review process a, a hurdle, or was it constructive for you? How did that feel? Um, no, I, I wouldn't say it was constructive. It was. Um, <laughs> it was just huge it was time consuming um it was big it was filling out all this stuff um you know doing this this stuff online here and this stuff online here and this and then follow this process and then do that there and then go back and do this one and then uh, yeah honestly it was <laughs> and I did it I did it twice <laughs> um yeah it, it's um I found I found a lot of it unnecessary too um, and particularly, I mean, I'm on the ethics committee at Fitirea, so you know, I'm I'm pretty au fait with with all the all the considerations. But I'd have to say, um, doing an ethics application through the Australian federal government is not something to be taken lightly. <laughs> Um, so a couple of you were, were doing PhDs by distance, and I guess that's a big consideration for people who are thinking about doing a PhD. Do I choose the closest institution to me because it's convenient, or do I choose, you know, another one that might offer me a scholarship or might have an expert in my field? What was it like, you know, being at a distance and being in a different country from your supervisors and, you know, just not having access to the the people, the, the maybe the face-to-face -face workshops that on-campus students would have or the library resources and support. How was that for you, Karen? Um, yeah, it was it was challenging. Um, I, I, I would have, have, having gone back to the university for my, um, for my graduation, I really, really wished that I could have been on campus. Um, I think it would have made a huge difference um, to be part of a, a learning community. I did join a couple of um, of online groups. One was a well a, a PhD wellbeing group during the first lockdown. So that was really, that was really really fortunate. Um, but it, it's not you you can't just um, you're not there. You don't have a community. You don't just bang into your supervisor. You can't sit and have a chat with them casually. Mm. But also the other things too, like um, I really missed um, not having the library. So, you know, it, so gathering resources was sort of a, a, a bigger deal than it, than it needed to be. Yeah. But, but in saying that, um, in saying that, uh, I, I wouldn't discourage people from, um, from doing their PhD in, an, in another country or at a different university that's not in town. It's just um, perhaps go, um, go into it with your eyes wide open and, and know that there are challenges involved with it. And uh, I guess have a think what that might mean for you individually and how you can mitigate those if, if necessary. Yeah, I do think you miss out on those kind of spontaneous interactions and just that um, 
you know, I don't know, just, yeah, you're right, that community of, you know, or being with other PhD students and bouncing off yeah. them and, and that kind of thing is, is, is part of what you miss as a distance student, isn't it? What was it like for you, Nigel? Uh, I'd say, Ms. Karen, I'd, I'd say I don't want to repeat all that because that was good stuff. Mm. One thing I, I found, which is maybe wasn't mentioned before, I don't know if this is just me, but I used to come from a journalistic background. And so I would like be working on a story and then sort of, I get an idea and that's got to go first. And it's, this has got to go first. So I would just be on the phone to the editor and very quite dramatic. And like, I kind of like that buzz. I found with me, I'd try to do that with my supervisor and then I'd get a response six weeks later. And by the time the response came, I'd actually completely gone off on another tangent and it's, ah, oh, shit. Now he wants me to go back to that. Yeah. My questions now are completely about, and I just got really, really, yeah. I just got really confused. I, I found that there was such a time lag and I, I'm i not good with that. I, I'm, I'm quite an immediate, Yeah. you know, I get... I don't know if it's an ADHD, but I just, I like that buzz. I like it to, yep. like, and it just wasn't there. Yeah. And, and I've, I've, I've had that working with masters and PhD students is that, like, you know, they're excited by something. They're wanting to progress something. And then they're waiting, hanging, hanging for weeks and weeks for the supervisor and nudging them and have you read my chapter yet? And, and it really can be deflating, I oh, think, yeah. for a lot of people. Mark, your supervisors were a little bit closer to home. What was that like for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's funny because I, I would qualify myself as a distance student actually I barely ever mm. went to, so I work at AUT I studied at the University of Auckland um, I could go there whenever I wanted but I barely ever did uh, only to go and visit my supervisors or perhaps there was a couple of books I wanted to get um, but yeah I, I actually found that the um, that experience for me I, I sort of went into it with an idea of what I expected um, and I was happy going going alone uh, a lot of the time and then interacting. Uh, I'm, I'm fortunate to have some really great colleagues. I'm sure I'm sure Karen and Nigel do too. Um, but yeah, people who I could essentially bounce ideas off of at times. Um, yeah, not not getting into specifics and you know being wary of ethics and everything, but just yeah, thinking through things. But uh, I, I think I was fortunate that my supervisors, while yeah, I, I would never expect them to respond to me. You know, the same day, yeah, the same yeah. day necessarily, but they were very good at, at responding in, in a timely fashion. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I think I, I I learned my lesson in one one case where I, I sent through an email, and I think I implied that I expected a response that was rapid, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't mean that, but I think it was interpreted that way. And I, I looked at it and thought, oh yeah, maybe I made it seem like I wanted an answer now. Uh, and I, I got a nice little response saying, your your turnaround time is. Um, uh, I, I can't remember the word they used, but it was certainly unrealistic. Let's put it that way. And uh, and I thought, okay, yeah, fair enough. You know, respect you. And um, yeah, I, I just I, I think I was fortunate in that way. But I can see how others might um, have a, have a, have another experience where the, the turnaround time is is way too long and um, yeah, just just so disruptive. So yeah, I think it does depend how lucky you are with your supervision and also. How happy you are just think okay well i know I've, I've got all this done i've given them all these things to react to um and i'll leave it now because i've got other stuff to get on with and i'll, I'll come back to it in a week or two i think in my case too dawn this is something which i didn't realize after i'd finished and this is something for uh people are thinking about this journey if you're going to be non-fee paying like me i think basically you go to the back of the queue the international fee paying students get service which actually kind of makes sense and I used to get very frustrated, like I've waited six weeks, but then it's like my partner, a couple of friends, you know, like you're getting a 50 grand degree for free. Will you stop whining? And it's like, well, yeah, actually you're right. You know, <laughs> you're right. Yeah. And I, I they, they, they never said that, but I, I, I think that might be going on if you're an international fee paying student, you get service. <clears throat> Yeah, that's that's interesting, and um, it is something I think anecdotally that certainly domestic students feel. I think you know it's one of my many PhD topics is trying to compare the experience of international students and domestic students because I do think sometimes domestic students feel like um, their supervisors may see other cohorts as having higher need and needing to focus their attention there, and it's like oh you know what you're doing, you'll be all right. And especially if you're a learning advisor, and so they know that you know how to write and you know how to you know reference and research and you know about academic integrity and those kinds 
kinds of things. Oh, well, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. And so maybe they, they are prioritising um, other people and, and actually, you know, I think we all need scaffolding and support on that PhD journey, don't we? Um, I wonder, do, do any of our um, attendees have any questions for the panellists? If you do, please feel free to unmute or turn your camera on or interrupt me. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll carry on. Um, we did raise a little um, a little bit about attrition, I guess, um, mm -hmm. about the attrition of, of PhD students. And, and Nigel, you said you, you know, you seriously thought about chucking it in at what yeah, point? I, I yeah. did actually. I stopped for um, three months and I got a sort of a medical sort of, oh, no. I mean, I was really lucky. My supervisor is a, is actually a medical doctor. He um, it was a, on the wards and very stressed and um Macquarie said to him if you want to do a uh, PhD on um, the language of patients uh, about AIDS uh, how um, patients are, like dealing with medical staff and all this blah 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 we'll give you a, we'll give you a job at the end so he was very when I went to him I said I'm basically going the same with stress which I have to do is he was really good he got me a, a dispensation through their counseling service I stopped for three months but then um what I did in the end was I actually stopped work and basically just went into a total immersion experience where I just uh, worked for four hours in the morning, just got fit in the afternoon, just went out, went to the dog beach, went to the park and went hard at the gym, got into my spirituality and then did the same in the evening for three hours. And I just did that for one year. I don't think I could have done it much longer, but I found I had to do that. I couldn't do this sort of a couple of hours. I could with the masters again, I could with the, any other thing I've done, but with this, it was, oh, I don't know. With me, once I get into the zone, I, I just want to stay there because it's complicated. Yeah. How about you, Karen? Did you sort of have those, um, what, what am I doing this for moment? So I uh, um, feel like tucking it in at any point? No. I, I, was, a, I was a woman on a mission. <laughs> but yeah. I, would, I would have to say, though, that the last two years were particularly grueling. Um, I relinquished three entire summer breaks to writing um, and basically all weekend, every weekend for the, for the last two years because I was working full time the whole thing. So, um, so it was pretty rough. I mean, it took a toll on, on um, the family. Mm. But I would have to say that um, my partner, when, when I finished, he's like, woohoo, you're done. Now, it's, now we can spend some time together. But the problem is, I'm now writing a book, <laughs> and I thought I thought the book would be a piece of cake compared to um, a PhD thesis. Turns out it's another PhD thesis, so we're back to square one again. Yeah. How about how about you, Mark? Like that sort of you know work life balance, I guess, is a real challenge. Were there other things that that were hurdles for you? Yeah, uh, I mean, for sure, I, I had to sort of take a break at a couple of points. Um, just for yeah, life things that needed dealing with that were yeah a bigger priority than than the PhD. But um, yeah, I, I never kind of reached the point where I was thinking of throwing in the towel. Um, I was yeah, I was a man on a mission. <laughs> um, Excellent. Just determined to see it through. Really, I think I would have um, yeah never forgiven myself for not 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 getting through it. I think that's an important thing to bear in mind. Um, despite all of the systems and the processes and everything that can be quite overwhelming, it, it is up to you essentially at the end of the day. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's working out how to fit it in and um, yeah, no, knowing when to maybe take a little break for, for your wellbeing and, and the wellbeing of your family and, and your friends. Um, but yeah, so, something um, I, I, I just remembered that, uh, during the sort of pre having written up my thesis phase, um, a, a former um, manager of mine was uh, unfortunately uh, on his in his palliative care, and I, I went to visit him in um, in his care, and uh, hadn't seen him for a while. And the last time I'd seen him, we talked about me doing a PhD, and that was several years previous. And he said, "Haven't you finished yet?" You know, and he uh, he basically gave me a lovely lesson and just said, "Look, you know, you're you're going to get this done, and you when you look back on it, and uh, the, the other work that you do, maybe you publish differently out of it." Uh, you're going to look back at your PhD and realise that was probably the worst thing you've ever done. 
Um, and I thought that's that's great perspective because you you can really lose sight of how how big it is. And um, it, yeah, it, of course, it's a big thing for the individual, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it is a transient passing phase. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a lovely note to to finish on. Actually, that um, it is a phase, it is a beginning, it is an end. Um, but it's yeah, it's just a little um, moment in your journey, isn't it? I'm conscious of time, but if I can just ask you very very quickly, do you have a um, a major lesson or a takeaway message maybe for learning advisors? Um, yeah, just a little quick last thought, Karen. Um, well, I mean, my, my PhD um, came straight out of my practice as a learning advisor. I had questions and I wanted to explore those questions. And so I guess what I'd say um, to learning advisors, if, if you have questions, if you have interests, if you're curious about stuff, if there's stuff you want to find out, if there's stuff that you think you can add to improve the experience for students, um, consider it and I would be very happy to talk to anybody who who wants to pick my brain at all thank you that's very generous I'm sorry who was that can you say that again please I think that was me I think I oh, added okay <laughs> Nigel uh, I suppose like my research and uh my sort of um background's a little bit uh removed from like uh, um, like being a learning advisor just with one student. I've done a lot of that work. Uh, I think once for me, once you, you kind of know what kind of things will trigger a student to become demotivated or amotivated, it puts you much more into a driving seat about how to um, uh, alleviate it. Like I, if I could yeah. just use an example, like I was teaching this uh, pre-entry course Tuesday Foundation at uh, Auckland. And um, the students had to do like a biography of a famous person and they couldn't, they couldn't get traction. So what I did was I just went away and had to think and I came back and said, I've got it. I showed them a little YouTube clip of Elton John uh, paying homage to Jonah Lumet at his concert in Wellington in 2016. Now, both those people are pretty easy to access. They just go away. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? They came back, they're both full of geniuses. Okay, now you can go away do your little bio, we did it all in class, now go away and then we start doing, and they were like, they really liked it because mm. they had like a taste of success pretty quick and said, I can, I can do this. Yeah. And it was just simple little things like that which I, before I might not have taken into account why they're getting demotivated, you gotta, you gotta be quite lateral in how you approach them. You know, it had to be like people they would know quickly they can access, just go and Google. It's like, you know, they both have very colorful lives. Yeah. Yeah, like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. so just seeing those synergies, I guess. You will yeah, see yeah. those synergies between your research mm -hmm. and your work. Mark, your final thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, other than what I said already about the perspective taking, I, I think that learning advisors definitely should be doing PhDs. Uh, if you want to, yeah, as Karen said, explore questions that you're interested in, then I think, yeah, the, the key detail that you need really is just the, the grit and the determination to, to see that through. Um, I think some of us think that we are, are not academic enough or we're not um, intellectually skilled enough or whatever it is. And that, that's all kind of hogwash really, I've realized <laughs> it's, um, it's ourselves are self-defeating there. Um, so I think, yeah, if you're, if you're passionate about a topic and you want to explore it and you can get some support from the, the institution around you, um, yeah, then just go for it, absolutely. Fantastic. Okay, um, I'm conscious of time, we're over time. So we'll just uh, finish with our karakia. I hope you can see that one. Unuhia, unuhia, unuhia utu uru tapu nui, ki a wātia, ki a māma, te ngātou, te tīnana, te wairua, i te ara takutu. Ko e rā e rongo, ki a wātia, ki a wātia, ai rā, ko a wātia, hau, pai marare. Thank you everyone, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for facilitating, thank you. You are very welcome and have a fabulous rest of your day. Um, to those of us who joined us from overseas, uh, have a fabulous sleep or, or rest of your afternoon, um, whatever it may be. Thanks, everyone. Nice to see you again. Thank you.